Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Israeli government spokesman Elon Levy. This is day 81 of the October 7th war. IDF fatalities since the start of the October 7 massacre stand at 492. In the past 24 hours, we have mourned the deaths of 25-year-old Sergeant First Class Joseph Gittarts, 24-year-old Staff Sergeant Elisha Yonatan Loba, and 21-year-old Staff Sergeant Daniel Nahmani. May their memories be a blessing, and our thoughts are, of course, with their families. Since October 7th, over 13,000 rockets have been launched towards sovereign Israel, deliberately targeting our civilians and sending millions running for the bomb shelters. Of those rockets, 2,000 have crash-landed inside the Gaza Strip, causing untold damage to civilians and infrastructure there. An update on the October 7th hostage crisis. Hamas still holds 129 people hostage in its terror dungeons since 10-7, 22 of whom have since been murdered in captivity, with Hamas holding their bodies hostage. We repeat our demand for the immediate and unconditional release of the vulnerable hostages still trapped in the Hamas terror dungeons. Time is running out for them. We are continuing to apply the same military pressure that forced Hamas into the first hostage release pause. And the Prime Minister has communicated with the leaders of all the great powers to demand their intervention to secure the hostages' release. As the Prime Minister told the Knesset yesterday after visiting troops in northern Gaza, we will shake every tree and turn over every rock to bring our hostages home. We are committed to the pledge that there will be no one left behind. That is a central goal of this war. Israel remains committed to fighting this war until the end to create a new reality in the wake of the 10-7 massacre that will benefit Israelis and Palestinians alike. Yesterday, Prime Minister Netanyahu spelled out the 3D vision for peace between Israel and our neighbors in Gaza. The destruction of Hamas, the demilitarization of Gaza, and the de-radicalization of Palestinian society. Those are the three prerequisites for peace. First, as Hamas threatens more October 7th massacres, any short, anything short of the dismantling of its military capabilities and the end of its political rule is a guarantee of further bloodshed. Second, we will have to ensure that Gaza is never again turned into a base of attacks against our people. That will require Israeli overriding security responsibility over Gaza for the foreseeable future, a temporary security zone on the perimeter of Gaza, and an inspection mechanism on the Gaza-Egypt border that prevents weapon smuggling. Third, and most importantly for enduring peace, Palestinian civil society must be transformed so that its people support fighting terrorism rather than funding it. Unfortunately, polls show that the overwhelming majority of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and West Bank alike still support the October 7th atrocities despite everything. That must change. We need to see courageous and moral leaders on the other side able to condemn barbaric violence instead of denying it and giving Hamas political cover as Palestinian Authority leaders have been doing. History shows that de-radicalization can transform even the most extreme societies into prosperous democracies and Western allies, and the same can and must happen here. For too long, failed foreign policy orthodoxies have kept this conflict on life support, trapping us in a cycle of violence. We urge the international community to help us secure these three conditions for peace after Israel's total victory over Hamas in order to turn a new leaf in Gaza and offer hope to this region. An update on the deeply problematic involvement of the United Nations in this conflict. For too long, international officials have been deflecting blame onto Israel to cover up for the fact that they are covering up for Hamas. In failing to condemn Hamas for hijacking aid and failing to condemn it for waging war out of hospitals, they have been complicit partners in Hamas's human shield strategy. They have let the world down. We are demanding global accountability, and now we are leading by example. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs has announced that visa requests by UN employees will no longer be granted automatically and will instead be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Israel will stop working with those who cooperate with the Hamas terror regime's propaganda machine, and we urge our allies to do the same and stand up for basic integrity in the global institutions that should serve and not sabotage international security. 
An update from the Northern Front. In the face of continued Hezbollah aggression, we are issuing a firm warning to the Iranian proxy on our northern border. Back off or be pushed away. The time is now for the international community to act for the full implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701, pushing Hezbollah's terror army away from our northern border. Every day that Hezbollah exists on our border in violation of international law is October 6th, posing an immediate threat of a much larger October 7th on the border with Lebanon. The State of Israel will not accept the continued displacement of 80,000 Israelis and the ongoing shelling of their homes, and the anti-tank missile attack just recently on the St. Mary's Greek Orthodox Church in Ikrit, injuring a civilian in Israel, is a reminder that for Hezbollah and its Iranian puppet masters, nothing is sacred. There is no going back. Either Hezbollah retreats as part of an effective diplomatic solution, our preferred option, or we will push it back ourselves using military force. Israel does not want a war on two fronts, but we will do whatever is necessary to return our people safely to their homes. That's the end of today's update. As always, we'll take your questions now. If you'd like to type your questions in the chat, and, and uh, of course, please write down your names and uh, media affiliations. Question comes from Dan Williams from the first question comes from Danny Williams from Reuters. One, when will the humanitarian corridor between Cyprus and Gaza be active? Two, which countries or shipping companies will transport the aid to Gaza? How and where will it be landed on the Gaza coast? And three, Israel has kept Gaza under naval blockade since 2007 and is legally required to exclude any and all ships from Gaza waters. How then can aid ships be admitted as part of this corridor? Uh, Mr. Williams, thank you for your question. I can say this. We are examining additional avenues for the international community to support civilian needs in Gaza, not through the Israeli crossings. It is, of course, a fiendishly difficult task to get aid into enemy-controlled territory when the enemy hijacks that aid, when UN agencies do not condemn it for doing so. And when we have updates, we will announce them. Now, for context, when Hamas declared war, on October 7th, the security cabinet decided to close those crossings that Hamas destroyed as part of the massacre. Now, as part of the agreement with the Americans, we have temporarily reopened Karam Shalom for deliveries of humanitarian necessities on the understanding that the United States will fund an upgrade of Egypt's Rafah crossing so that provisions will no longer have to go through our border. Um, you know, our role is to screen humanitarian aid trucks for Hamas weapon smuggling attempts, and there is still excess screening capacity at Nitsana and Karim Shalom. If the United Nations wants more aid to get in, it should send more aid. There are no restrictions on our side. Uh, but as and when we have updates on the modalities of how more aid will be able to uh, get in, we will, of course, announce them. From Jonathan Rice of the New York Times. How does Israel view the Egyptian peace proposal, which it has been reported includes Hamas in a transitional Gaza government? The Israeli government remains committed to the goals of this war, which are to destroy Hamas's military and governing machine inside the Gaza Strip and the return of the hostages. We understand and our allies understand that this war must end with the end of Hamas. Hamas will no longer govern the Gaza Strip in a way that has allowed it to launch tens of thousands of rockets against our cities and to launch the October 7th uh, massacre. Uh, now, of course, I can't comment on any other uh, specific details about specific negotiations other than to say it's been obvious from day one that Hamas is prioritizing its grip on power over the lives of the entire civilian population in the Gaza Strip. This war can end immediately if Hamas surrenders, turns over its war criminals, lays down its arms and immediately releases the hostages. And we think that should be the basic demand from all elements of the international community concerned with ending this war in a way that ensures that Hamas can never attack us again to demand the unconditional surrender of the army of terror that launched the October 7th massacre. David Isaac of JNS. Initially, Israel said it would cut off aid if it turned out it was diverted to Hamas. It clearly does. The U.S. at the start also said aid would stop. Instead, the U.S. calls for still more aid. 
Is there any discussion of returning to the, to the original formula of cutting aid off since Israel has no obligation to resupply its enemies? First of all, Israel has no interest in seeing a humanitarian crisis or any sort of humanitarian suffering inside the Gaza Strip. Now that uh, aid is not being delivered effectively because of Hamas's war, uh, we're seeing all those aid agencies reminding the world of actually how much was going in through the Israeli crossings the day before the war and the day before Hamas decided to attack those crossings. Uh, we are demanding that the United Nations and other international agencies condemn Hamas for hijacking aid. Uh, we note, for example, that UNRWA, which has proven itself an ineffective mechanism for distributing aid, uh, on 16th of October, I think it was, condemned, uh, put out a tweet stating that Hamas had stolen supplies, including fuel from its stockpiles, and then deleted that tweet, covering up for Hamas and denying reports on social media, which are in fact its own tweets. We want to see the international community calling Hamas to account for hijacking aid. And as we said, we will no longer accept international officials deflecting blame onto Israel and accusing it of all sorts of monstrosities in order to cover up the fact that they are covering up for Hamas. We don't want to see any humanitarian suffering in the Gaza Strip, and it is important that aid reach the civilian who need it and that Hamas not steal it. And we have to start with international accountability on that. The next question from Joel Park of Breitbart News. There are still rockets being fired at cities in the south. When does Israel anticipate being able to shut down rocket attacks from Gaza completely? Um, Mr. Pollock, we're not going to give specific deadlines for when we're going to be able to block off rocket fire from the Gaza Strip, but that is a central aim of this war. We will no longer allow the Gaza Strip to be used as one launch rocket launch pad against Israeli cities. Now, already we have announced that we have captured and destroyed 30,000 explosives inside the Gaza Strip, including rocket launchers, including rocket launchers on trucks, including rockets that were ready to be fired at Israeli uh, cities. Uh, and we're going to continue with that effort as we move through the Gaza Strip and dismantle the Hamas terror state. This is going to take time. Hamas has spent 16 years deliberately embedding itself in civilian areas, and we've exposed the evidence of those rocket launchers embedded within mosques and scout centers and other civilian infrastructure. And that is the central goal of this war, to dismantle the Hamas terror state and make sure that no security threat against the Israeli people will ever emanate from the Gaza Strip ever again. One final question from Anna Julian of the Jewish Press. The U.S. is quote, preparing the Palestinian Authority for a role in Gaza um, on the day after the war. What is the government's response to this? Uh, the government has been clear we will not tolerate the introduction of any entry of any element into the Gaza Strip that funds as opposed to fighting terrorism. We have seen the uh, Palestinian Authority Prime Minister Mohammed Shdaya calling Hamas an integral part of the Palestinian mosaic. Now, that is not a signal from someone who is serious about fighting terrorism. That is a signal from an authority that is making excuses for terrorism, covering up for terrorism, and giving it political cover. We think that whoever governs the Gaza Strip the day after Hamas must be committed to fighting terrorism, repudiating its violent ideology, instead of giving it political cover, and the Palestinian Authority at the moment is not a partner for that reconstruction effort. Um, and it's worth remembering that the last time Israel gave the Gaza Strip on a silver platter to the Palestinian Authority, it ended up getting toppled from power and Hamas took over, and we will not be repeating the same mistakes again. We're good students of history. Okay, and that's all for today. Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll update you about the timing of tomorrow's press conference. Thank you very much. Everyone keep safe. Thank you.